Okay, let's get this started. Um, I appreciate your guys' time. So I just want to first and foremost thank everybody who's on the Zoom call right now. I appreciate each and every one of you. I appreciate your time. I know there's a lot of Zooms going around these days. Everybody's doing everything online. Um, so I do appreciate your time. We really want to try to make this worth your while. We're going into just, this is just month three of the wine club. Um, so it's just starting out. It's growing. I'm really excited. Um, and again, I can't do it without, without you guys. So I really appreciate your support from day one. It means a lot. So today, this month's wine club, we have uh, Pinot Noir, right? We've been doing kind of this theme of old world against new world with these international varietals to try to get a better feel of, you know, the regions that represent them well and how they taste. Um, so really excited for that. We have two amazing guest speakers on today, which is really the direction that I want to take with the wine club, again, and trying to provide you with the, as much content as possible. Um, and not just hearing it from me, I'm mean, hearing it from these leaders in the industry who are actually doing it and getting their hands literally getting their hands dirty. So um, super excited to have them both on. So we have Mr. Anthony Filiberti. He's the current, uh, one of three winemakers, I believe, from Ant Hill Farms out of Anderson Valley. Um, and we also have Laurent Michik, who is a, uh, a Burgundy native, if I'm not mistaken, and um, a co-founder of H. Mercer Imports and um, just an overall badass in the distribution game, which I'm really happy to, to have them both. Gentlemen, thank you both for your time. We'll try to go in order here. Maybe Anthony, I don't know if you wanted to give us um, just a quick little background on yourself and kind of what it is that you're doing and, and how you got to doing it. Sure. Um, well, I mean, Ant Hill Farms is, this is our, will be our 18th vintage. So in 03, my business partners, Dave and Webb, we met at working at a winery called William Selium. Um, and six months later had, you know, we'd become friends and excuse me, we, uh, we bought two tons of fruit and started a winery, um, a ton or actually three tons, two tons from Anderson Valley and one ton from the Sonoma coast. And since then it's just been, you know, a slow progression to where we're at now. Um, I grew up, I'm, I'm in Healdsburg at our winery right now. I grew up in Grayton, California, right by Iron Horse Winery and started working in wineries in high school uh, when I was 16 and then just kind of stuck with it and studied viticulture farming. And eventually mid nineties, I was sort of spinning my wheels in Sonoma County um, and moved up to Oregon in 1996 where I worked at Rex Hill Winery with this woman named Lynn Penterhash who's still a friend. Um, and I ended up working with uh, this guy, Josh Bergstrom. He might've tried some of those wines. Sure. Um, and then ended up becoming friends with him and starting Bergstrom Winery in 1999 with his family. Um, and then eventually came back down to California in 03 when I met Dave and Webb William Sellian. Um, and really Oregon was I mean, I was 23 at the time. So when I moved back, I was in my late 20s. It was a real influential time and organics and sort of natural purity was still a prominent theme. The things were changing a little bit and there was this contentiousness between new and old, which is pretty much always the case wherever you are in the wine world. But there was this old guard that were just purists and it really appealed to me at this young age. Um, especially on the farming end, organics and biodynamics. That's where I was first got into permaculture and biodynamics um, with Josh, who's continued that, and uh, Sam Tannehill, who's now, I think, owner and winemaker of Rex Hill, and his wife, Cheryl. Um, I mean, there's a number of people. Doug Tunnell was part of that group. Um, and then coming back down here, it was actually kind of a shock because... Sonoma County out of Napa, Sonoma Mendo was the least organic as far as farming goes. And it was, it was confusing because Sonoma County in, in my mind was this progressive area, but the farming just sort of lagged behind a little bit. And that's kind of what drove us initially to Anderson Valley because Mendocino has a, a, a history of organic farming that goes back to, you know, pro, row crop farmers, orchard farmers, um, there's a big biodynamic farm in Anderson Valley that was deeded to a couple for a hundred years. And so having, going up there all the time, you really got the chance to see in a small scale, like what could be done in organics and biodynamics. Um, 
and it's not really difficult, frankly, but that was a big part of the impetus of starting Ant Hill was to like source out those sites that really resonated with us, not just for the wines, but also for the practices of what they were doing. And then as we've progressed, we've actually started leasing long-term leases for half of our production where we control all the farming. So it's, it's become relatively streamlined in that process. Initially, there's a lot of conversations with growers to get them to transition to, you know, a more sustainable way of farming. And they're always afraid of losing money, which, you know, obviously is a big concern, but um, it's changed a lot in the last 17 years. People are a lot more open-minded. Mm. And I'm not 27 anymore telling them how to farm, which was a big challenge initially. And that's where we are now. I mean, right now we make about 6,000 cases of wine um, with 12 different wines. So it's, it's all spread out and about a third of that production is uh, all Sonoma Coast Pinot. So most of the single vineyards in the Anderson Valley as well are pretty small production wines. Amazing. Well, I'm, I'm super, <laughs> I feel honored that we have it. I know how small production it is. So I'm really happy that we could get some and get it in front of our members too. So thank you for that intro. Um, one thing I, I forgot to do you guys, and I apologize because again, I, I've been a part of a lot of Zooms, especially where there's alcohol involved and nobody drinks up front and I hate that. So a big cheers to everybody. It is a happy hour at the end of the day. I just want to thank you again for taking all your time um, and please cheers. What I'd, what I'd love to do is, is get a little intro from you, Laurent, if that's okay, kind of same thing, just kind of how you got into the game of what you're doing now. And then I'd love to circle back with you guys and maybe I'll, I would love for you guys to just walk through your own wines. Because what I do with the wine club is I do a little, a quick video for everybody that's in it to break down the wine. So I feel like most of the people here have already seen that video. If not, they have access to it and they probably heard me talk too much at this point, I think the point is to get um, to get your perspective and how you would walk through your own wine. So I'd love to kind of move into that next. But first, Laurent, would you um, would you mind just kind of telling us how you got into the game and to where you are now? Hi, Rafael. Thank you very much for the and hi everyone as well. Thank you very much for the opportunity to have us to share our experiences and our passion tonight. Um, as Rafael said, I was actually born in Burgundy. Uh, in France and um, at a very early stage, like when I was 10, 11 years old, my dad started taking me on wine tasting tours on Saturday's afternoon. We would visit two or maybe three wineries and I was allowed to smell the wine and taste and spit. And um, I became friend with uh, the son of the winemakers and we were visiting and we are my age. And at uh, the age of 15, 16 years old, when I had to decide for a job and a career, I decided and I wanted to go to work in restaurants. So my second passion is also traveling all over the world. So I went for a sommelier, wine director, beverage specialist certifications, and uh, I arrived in Burgundy. And so I visited and tasted all those vineyards since, since I was very young. And uh, I got recruited in a Mission Star restaurant in San Francisco 18 years ago. So that's how I arrived in California. A restaurant is a very tough work, uh, very challenging hours. You have to work nights, you have to work weekends, holidays. And I kind of got tired of the lifestyle. So 10 years ago, I met my business partner, Mark Leston, and we decided to found uh, H. Mercer Wine and Spirit Imports. Um, like I said, we've been around for 10 years. It's been a challenging process. It's been a lot of work, but it's also been a successful process. Uh, our philosophy is to support small wineries, small production, and, and all estate-grown fruits. So there is no mass-produced wines in any, anything that we import from Europe, Australia, Chile, and um, all estate fruit, small productions, farmers, families, and we're very proud and very pleased of what we've been doing so far. 
I love it. I love it. There's a lot. I mean, I'm really, I'm really excited. You guys, I wanted on both of the things that you said, there's so much stuff that I want to unpack there and kind of get into. Um, God, just on both ends, there's so much that Laurent, especially with you right now. I mean, just with everything that's happening in the world of imports and everything and Anthony on the biodynamic side, I have some questions there, but um, I guess Laurent, since you've been talking, why don't, do you want to just walk us through real quick on how you would approach, I know this is a wine you might have bias towards, <laughs> But maybe just walk us through how you would approach this burgundy, kind of some of your thoughts on it. I mean, I know you're pretty close with the producer as well. So maybe anything, any insights you can give us on the Domaine Rene Leclerc that we have for this month. So yeah, the um, producers, I'm sure you have a glass uh, in front of you as well. The producer is uh, Rene Leclerc. We are starting with his uh, generic Bourgogne Pinot Noir. So it is actually a very prestigious domain in the village of uh, in the village of Gevray Chambertin, very highly regarded for uh, many years, for three generations, and uh, the fruit, the juice that we are drinking today is, as I may say, is a declassified uh, Gevray Chambertin. Why do I say that? It's um, this family was very famous in Gevray Chambertin in Burgundy for the longevity of their wines. So that means they were making wines in the 80s and in the 90s, then you would need 15, 20, 30 years to be able to fully enjoy before. So what it did, uh, because the consumers are changing and nobody's aging wines for so much longer, and people want to drink the wine right away. So when Francois, the son of René Leclerc, took over officially in 2009, but the process was slowly started before, every single grapes that arrive at the winery goes to a sorting table at the entrance of the winery. And there is five, six ladies on each side of the table, ladies or gentlemen, but usually it's mostly ladies then do that uh, before or after lunch. And they sold the grape, and they sold the grape one by one. So what they decided to do is basically to destem, Because when you make a wine, then it's going to be ready to drink in 20 years average, for example. The stem is going to bring tannins and structure and greenness to the, vine, to the wine, to the juice, then it's going to evolve slowly but surely. But now then we are consuming the wines much younger, they decided to destem and sell the grape one by one. So basically, when they destem the grapes by hand one by one, some grapes are maybe a little overripe or maybe a little underripe, but they are not good enough to, do, to go to the Gevray Chambertin village, to go to the Gevray Chambertin Premier Cru, or even even to the griot Chambertin Grand Cru that they are producing. So this grape goes to the left bucket, actually. We call it the left bucket, and it they goes to the juice. It's not that they are bad, it's just that they are not good enough for a premier cru or a grand cru. And then the rest of the vineyard is also when they replant in the village or in the premier cru of the Appalachians, when they replant the vines, the first seven to 15 years, the fruit doesn't give enough, doesn't give as much complexity as an older vine. So same, those young vines are declassified to this generic Bourgogne Pinot Noir. And then there is a little bit of the vineyard that is inside the village of Gevray Chambertin, but just outside of the village appellations. So those grapes go to these Burgundy appellations. Laurent, if I could interrupt you really quickly, just for the people that are listening, how would you, because you're mentioning Gevry Chambertin, which is a, a village, right, in the, nor in the northern part of Burgundy, in the Côte de Nuit, but how would you break it down for the people who are listening just from a generic point as far as Borgonia versus village versus some of the single vineyards that you were mentioning? So you're basically asking me to talk for the next three hours. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Burgundy is a, is a region of France, uh, about three hours southeast of Paris. It sounds complicated, but it's actually very easy to understand. Every white wines from Burgundy are Chardonnay. Every red wines from Burgundy are Chardonnay. Burgundy has Chablis, 
in the north as the Makone Puyifusi region in the south. And then in the middle, there is a nice long line from west to east, then we call the Côte d'Or. Côte d'Or is where the best Pinot Noirs and Chardonnays in the world come from, if I may say. And uh, it's divided in two categories, Côte de Bonne, I'm talking about Chassagne Montrachet, Puligny Montrachet, Meursault. That's going to be the Côte de Bonne. That's where the best Chardonnays in the world come from. And then the northern eastern part is the Côte de Nuit, the night coat. That's the Pinot Noirs. And then you have different villages. You have Fissin, Gevray Chambertin, Von Romanet. Maurice Saint Denis and Chambol Musigny. Those are the main, main uh, villages. Every single terroir is different. You have to know that those terroir, those appellations, were decided by the monks 2,500 years ago. And those monks decided to separate that vineyard on the right side of the road with the vineyard on the next side of the road, just by tasting, eating the ground. So we're talking about an amazing, magical place for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. It's, it's extremely unique. Gevray Chambertin is a village that is known for producing more masculine Pinot Noir with a little more gaminess, with a little more animal side, if I may say and they are usually bigger and richer. Thank you, thank you for that breakdown. Um, you mentioned something that's super interesting to me and that we hear a lot about sometimes, and maybe I can switch this over to you, Anthony. I'd, I'd be really interested to get your take on it from the winemaker's perspective. But Laurent had mentioned how there's a sorting table for these grapes, right? And a lot of these, a lot of the, the process involves destemming of the grapes and, and kind of sorting them away from these stems. Whereas I know if I'm not mistaken for the Anderson Valley, there is a low, a low percentage of actual whole cluster um, that goes into this wine, if I'm not mistaken. And I just wanted to get your take on, you know, a lot of times these terms are thrown out. And we're really trying to think about what that means at the end of the day when what we can expect coming out of this bottle, right? Like the, and, and Laurent, I know he did touch on it a little bit, but the de-stemming completely versus whole cluster as a technique that you might use in some of your wines. Yeah, all of our wines we use between 40 and 60% whole cluster. Mm. So we sort the fruit as he described, uh, first for a whole cluster, which goes on the bottom of the tank, and then we sort and destem fruit on top of it so that the clusters are at the bottom <clears throat> and the destemmed berries are at, on the top. For us, the intention is if we're, we primarily punch down you know, once a day um, during the height of fermentation a couple times a day, and almost never pump over, um, at least for Pinot Noir. The intention is that when you're punching down, what you're punching is the distemmed fruit and you're trying to leave the whole clusters completely intact at the bottom. So the firm, through the fermentation, they're basically just sitting more or less at the bottom of the tank. You know, inevitably, as the CO2 is created, some of them float to the top into the solids and you end up punching them down with the distemmed fruit. But the point of that is, one, it's aromatic qualities we really enjoy from the whole cluster uh, mixed with a little bit of distemmed fruit. Uh, we tend to get more of a floral, you know, herbal thing from the, it's not carbonic, but it's a encapsulated fermentation inside the berry. You tend to get a really bright aromatic quality from those whole clusters. The aromatics are through the roof on this wine. Sorry to interrupt, but I mean, that's one of the things that I noticed immediately. The aromatics are so pretty, so intense, so lifted on this wine. It's really yeah. beautiful. And I mean, and that, you know, you can smell that in the wine when it's fermenting at the press. You really smell it as you're crushing the whole clusters for the first time. Um, the other intention is works in California. It's relatively easy for us to get power and weight and texture. And using a lot of whole cluster tends to make, at least for us, by, by not touching them ever, to make a little bit less extraction and more elegant style. Um, and we don't, because we're not touching the stems, we're not really getting stem tannin per se. Um, 
you get a little bit of the flavor of the stem, but the tannin is pretty minimal. We actually, in the past, when we just stemmed fruit early on, with punching down, we tended to extract more skin tannin and get more powerful wines than with using a lot of whole cluster um, in our experience. The other point of it is that um, we pick relatively early. You know, in California standards, this is, I think, 13 something, but sometimes they're 11 and a half, 12. The potassium that's trapped in the stems actually helps. Our acids sometimes are so high that it's, they're pretty nervy and, and a lot of tension and it helps to precipitate some of those acids and still have that red fruit flavor that we're looking for by picking slightly right, less ripe. Um, obviously that changes every year. The way the weather is out, you know, has been for the last five years is it's all over the place. And sometimes the heat just plays a big impact on what flavor profile you might get from the vineyard. Mm. And it, honestly, like in, in sort of a broader sense or, a, you know, a philosophical sense, you're taking, for us, you're taking the whole product and fermenting with more of the whole product that's coming from the vine. Um, it's not always for the better. I mean, sometimes we should have used less and sometimes more, but we do like what it gives to the wine. And I think it, it makes them prettier from our perspective. And because we're doing that for most of the vineyards with minor tweaks, depending on you know, berry size and heat of the vineyard, the winemaking is relatively consistent. So you tend to get the differences are coming from the site, which is what keeps us interested. Um, and it, it changes every year a little bit, but primarily you can taste the vineyard. And in this blend, which is all of our single vineyards, it's, it's a barrel selection of the more approachable um, from Anderson Valley. Most of our sites in Anderson Valley are pretty structured wines, more so than Sonoma Coast. So picking the more approachable ones from those sites is, is the intention of this. It's not necessarily to expose the vineyard characteristics as much. You said something intriguing, then uh, if you can explain a little more about, do you think the stem is bringing floral notes to the wine? Uh, the whole berry is, um, the berries that are completely intact. So when we, when we drain the, the fermentation at the end of its elevage, um, they pretty much come out completely whole in most of the vineyards. So when we're pressing them, those bear, all, a lot of the aromatics are trapped inside the berry. They're not volatilizing out of the top of the fermentation. Yes. Um, and then, you know, we cover the, after we punch down, we cover everything and try to capture those really volatile alcohols that have the really pretty high tones that you get. And they just go away really quickly. Oftentimes in fermentation and in the wine too, like those nuances of high tones that are super volatile in wine kind of come and go. Um, but if you trap it all in the berry, it tends to get more of it into the wine. Um, I've heard it called intracellular fermentation. I know that uh, Dujac sort of is known for that, but it, well, we are, we're not really seeing fermentation happen in the cells of the berries, but what we do see is the CO2 and the alcohol being created right inside the skin. And it's, you know, you're agitating it a little bit, but the CO2 also has like a scrubbing effect. Like when you drink Pellegrino or whatever carbonated drink you drink, it sort of gently takes out the solids um, and then simultaneously trapping all of those really pretty aromatics. And it's, you know, it's really joyful when you, if you ever get a chance to go to a winery that's doing that, when they press, it's, is when you really get that just burst of aromatics that's, a lot of it's trapped in the wine, but a lot of it, you know, it's so volatile, it just, that first 20 minutes of the press, is just amazing. Mm -hmm. Anthony, I was curious, I just ran this little quick poll on here to see how many people had had Pinot Noirs from Anderson Valley. I feel like you know, for California wine regions, especially for, you know, for Pinot, a lot of times we can get shadowed by, you know, if we're talking Pinot, right, regions like Sonoma, right, and, and Anderson Valley kind of gets mentioned after those, but, you know, what, what is one thing that you would want people to know about Anderson Valley that maybe might not get mentioned enough? Um, I mean, honestly, the, well, there's a sort of a thread is what you mentioned is Mendes or Anderson Valley, I think maybe in the 90s and early 2000s actually had as much, a lot of attention, um, especially with sommeliers that were looking for cooler climate. 
And then, you know, those people's attention wanes and they're always looking for something a little bit different. But um, one of the things that everyone talked about is, you know, the west side versus the east side, you know, closer to the ocean versus closer to the valley end. And the cool thing about Anderson Valley is it almost runs north south. And that's, it's very dramatic in a five mile drive, you know, as the crow flies, you head towards the coast, but you also head pretty far north. So you have Boonville on one side and, and Navarro, Philo on the other. And you get a pretty dramatic difference in the quality of the wines. Obviously, you know, the winemakers oftentimes, because you have flexibility at harvest, may pick really, really ripe in the further north parts. Um, but the people who are buying from both areas with the same intention, you see really distinct, like cooler climate, fresher vibrancy up near Navarro and, and Philo, Windling Vineyard and Kaiser. And we make Baker Ranch, which is up on a ridge in, in Philo. And then <clears throat> further west, you get this brawnier, more intense uh, structured wines with higher alcohols typically, but also lower acids in there the structure is really coming from the tannins that you get on these steep hillsides. Uh, as the wind comes in, obviously it, it sort of circulates around the Eastern part and thickens the skins considerably. But that North South is a really, it's hard to, I mean, I still, whenever I'm in the vineyards, I say, Oh, that's West. And it's, it's due North almost. Mm. Um, and then all that said, I think, it's one of the best places to explore sort of a bucolic lifestyle that still is, I mean, it's more and more rare in California as, as things have changed uh, culturally in this state. And there's farms and there's small community, but the wineries are still very much like mom and pop type places for better or worse. I mean, sometimes the wines are terrible, but you know, you get a really cool idiosyncratic personality that you're tasting wine with, which makes the experience pretty cool. Um, now, when you say that, things changed culturally in, 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 you know, in California, are you, you, you touched on it a little bit earlier. Are you maybe mentioned, are you referring to um, maybe how the consumer is looking for, for goods right now? And, you know, there's been a big focus yeah, on, on part of it on organically produced products and people are really paying a lot of attention into how their food is being made and how a lot of things that the consumer being made, which has in turn led to this, you know, big trend and wave of, you know, natural wines, right? Do you think that that Anderson Valley is kind of poised to, to produce wines that will be, that there'll be more? Well, I think, well, in that region? the natural wine sort of if, as like a movement has tended to look for um, one, they're less expensive, growing regions and, and varietals. Um, and they're also cooler because they're, you know, they're not very readily available. So you have like Albarino and Vermentino and Malvasia, and you have Petnats and you have Valdegui and, you know, Toraldigo, all these great varietals. They're just not really well known. Hipster juice. It, huh? It's hipster juice. Yeah, I mean, in some sense it is, but um, I think Anderson Valley, because of the farming costs, may never really, you know, because it's a little bit, your yields are lower and it's harder to farm on these hillside vineyards in general. Um, it doesn't make it appealing to like a newer winery that's trying to, you know, be part of participating in the natural wine thing because the value of the wines, you just have to inherently charge more money um, or buy, you know, more expensive fruit or whatever it is, which way you look at it. Um, I think culturally what I meant is California in, in some sense in the wine growing areas has become so expensive that it's it's very difficult to be a landowner or a you know sort of a premium winery because the cost is inhibitive. And Anderson Valley, you know, even though it's Mendocino and it's like two, 20 miles north of here is still a relative value and the lifestyle up there is a lot different than a lot of Sonoma County and Napa, especially. Um, it's just a different experience for California if you want something that's, you know, a little more visceral and, and less contrived. It's a really appealing spot for a lot of people. Uh, and the wines are, you know, it's just like anywhere. The, there's not a lot of wineries up there. So the wines are what they are. I would say in general, historically, the best wines I've tried have been made by people who are shipping the grapes out of the valley to, you know, their wineries, wherever they may be. Mm. Uh, and there's a few exceptions in the last few years. I mean, Domain Anderson, which is 
part of Rotorer has made some good wines. Jeremy Sess is their consultant. And, you know, there's a, a few others that are making higher quality wines in the last five, 10 years. Interesting. And what you said something about buyers, like, I think in general, it doesn't matter what the commodity is. They're looking for something that feels authentic. And younger people especially are very adept at picking up how they're being marketed to. You know, they've been exposed to it for so many year, more years from, they're just sort of tuning out all the noise of marketing, um, except for whatever reason. I mean, Instagram seems to be losing some attention for younger people already, and it's only been around for, what, 10 years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and people have tried to use that to promote their image. But marketing in general in the wine world is, I think, lost on a lot of younger people. Yeah, I mean, I think there's an interesting conversation there, right? I think yes and no. I think my opinion too, and my experience from a lot of the things that I see is, um, I think people get hooked on a lot of easy marketing tactics and follow a wine without really knowing, you know, the source of where the wine comes from, how it's being made, where the grapes are being grown, um, because there's maybe some bells and whistles um, coming from an Instagram influencer that you know is making and sells you selling you this image on the wine right like we're look we're seeing some of these celebrity releases recently right of you know releasing their wines and saying this is natural and you know great products and very untouched and organic but they're really not telling you anything and my fear is that people are actually getting caught up in that because of the I think you're right I think it's just a short lived you know it's another it's a short trend um yeah. it, from like you know we have a pretty big relatively big mailing list in different demographics. Um, a lot of younger people in the last couple of years, they, they get, they catch on quickly. You know, in the past, like all you had to do was see a score and whether it was wine advocate or a uh, wine spectator, and you sort of were a made person for a while. And I think because they are exposed to so much information for so long, they digest it and then they move on and, you know, it doesn't take very long anymore. In the past, it was took years for people to lose their luster. It didn't matter what they were doing as far as a product. Um, and then there's, you know, there's classic regions that I think, like, you know, Burgundy obviously has a built-in story that is never going to go away. Um, and the quality overall is, I think, higher than it's ever been, although, this, you know, the style has changed somewhat in the last 10 years or so, um, in a broad sense. You know, there's still people making classic wines, but they're more, much more approachable than they used to be. Yeah, I mean, that's a great segue. I literally had that as a question I wanted to ask Laurent. It's like, what's your kind of, what's your take, Laurent, on the on the state of the industry with Burgundy? There's been a lot of changes, it feels like, in the last 10 years. A lot of things to unpack there, obviously, you know, with, with how the climate's changing, how the consumers are, how the consumer base is changing a little bit now, right, as we move into these younger generations and, and they might not be looking to spend all their paycheck on a on a bottle of highly sought after burgundy you know what are what are your thoughts on how it's progressed and maybe where it's heading well first thing i have to agree with uh, what anthony said about those natural wines and orange wines and the way things are going i do believe it is a trend um it's been hard for the last couple of years it's getting hotter and hotter but i think it's people are going to get tired of it because at the end of the day they're going to realize that they're drinking wines with flows so we orange wines natural wines were the way that we were making wines in the middle age and now it's a new trend because <laughs> just like it uh, sorry instagram never told me how to dress up and uh, what to drink so yes, I am all world. Yes, I am from Burgundy. And as long as the wines are good, no matter if they are natural, orange, or with sulfites, I will drink them. So that's my point of view on that. Now, yes, things are changing in Burgundy. Uh, first of all, my, my, what I've noticed the most in the last 10 years, and what I enjoy the most as well is without naming it, a very famous uh, American wine critic was promoting New Oak uh, everywhere and he was traveling too. And some people, some winemakers from Burgundy, from Bordeaux, from all over the world, then let's say had to a big bank loan and they needed the scores to sell their wines at a very expensive price. 
so they could pay the loan quicker, would use lots of new work. Well, that's for sure have changed. Uh, the amount of new oak in Burgundy wines has been reduced by 50 to 75% in the last five, eight years. And what I've noticed even more in the last couple of years is that people are using 500 liter barrels used instead of the regular size barrels. Then is 226 liters. So that's definitely a great news on that. Um, the climate change the, has definitely affected the, the mostly the farming. The winemaking changes because the hot climate is gonna thicker the skin and the seeds of the grape. So it's gonna bring tannins to the wine. So now you don't need as much new oak to have more tannins in the wines. It's already come naturally from the skin and the seed of the grape. So that's one first change. And then the pruning has changed. Instead of pruning as much as possible, so the removing as many leaves as you can as the grape, uh, so the grape can get more sun. Now they're leaving a bigger canopy on it and they're harvesting a little early, but we are seeing the alcohol content jump one degree yep. from 13.5 to 14.5 from 2014 to 2018 vintage. So it is an everyday challenge, but I think it's more on the farm inside. And then again, uh, less oak in, 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 in the winery, in the edging side. Anthony, how are you seeing some of those changes affect Anderson Valley? Because even a buddy of mine, I was having a conversation who was you know, he's Irish and he was like, yeah, this global warming, everybody thinks that it's, you know, making everything hotter, but he was like, what, like, for example, from where I'm from in Northern Ireland, it's giving us a lot more rain. It's just making, we're having a lot more rain problems. And I wonder if that's, is that happening at all in the vineyards from where you guys are? Or are there uh, other- In the Valley, I, I think you see more heat as you head inland. Um, what we're seeing just, it's very simple is all along the Sonoma coast, on the higher elevation sites, primarily I'm talking about, um, we're significantly cooler than most areas throughout the summer and fall until about 10 years ago, they started getting warmer because it was getting so warm in the interior, it was pulling the marine layer past the coast where in the past it was like just below the vineyard all day. So it was 75, 85. Now it's pulling the fog, the marine layer, you know, further east. And then obviously as it gets into warmer areas, it, it dries out and it goes away. So you have these clear sunny days on the coast um, with higher temperatures in general. And that's true in Anderson Valley. Um, the furthest west or northwest parts of Anderson Valley 20 years ago weren't even planted yet because it was, it's a redwood forest, you know, it's a rainforest. And now those areas are drying out and they're more permissible for growing grapes in those areas. The, the eastern part is hotter and hotter, and, and we do see thicker skins. Uh, we see more bitterness in the, in the seeds because they're not quite as ripe as they used to be. So you moderate, as a winemaker, you become more gentle on those grapes than you would something further northwest. Um, and that's true. I was at Hirsch, you know, for a while making wine and I mean, it was incredibly warm at times there. It was shocking. And I looked at their historical data because David Hirsch, you know, he barely leaves the property and, and always was, you know, writing stuff. And from when he started planting it, the average temperatures have gone up by about eight degrees. Um, that may be, you know, anecdotal. It may not actually re be the truth about what's going on, but that's what his experience was. And, uh, you know, you just tend to see higher alcohols. Um, and you have to pick a little bit earlier and the flavors are, and structure is different because of that. But yes, you see it. Are and you guys really, really that what we see though is, I, I was gonna say what we see is extreme weather events more and more. Yeah. Whether it's a lot of rain where we flood or very, very hot, obviously. Um, we've had more snow, <clears throat> consistent snow than we've ever had before up in the hills. 
Hmm. So there, you know, you, you see the averages only tell part of the story. It's the extremes that create the average, right? So right. the days that are 110 are much more than they were in the past. And, but the days that are 18 are much more than they were in the past. So you have fro more frost, you know, all of the issues that come up with, with extreme weather events. Are you, we have to, we have other uh, areas? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Are you guys looking at actively looking at other areas to plant or to source grapes from as the temperatures increase? Yeah, I mean, that's ideal. It's just at some level, it's not logistically possible to drive all over California. I mean, it takes two hours to get to Comchi, which is our coolest site up there, and an hour and a half to Baker Ranch. Um, I think ultimately what you see is some of what Laurent said where your farming practices change, very few people are pulling leaves aggressively like they used to. Mm -hmm. They're trying to protect the canopy. They're, they're actually putting the canopy versus a vertical. They're putting it on a split system. So as the grapes, the vines tip, there's some shading for the fruit and creating, you know, even just a couple degree difference in the fruit zone is dramatic over a two month period. Um, yeah, at some point it's, it, it potentially could be unviable to grow, but the the extremes are unknown because you would think as global warming happened that the ridge right next to the coast would be ideal and it's becoming more and more too hot, whereas just a mile inland where it used to be warmer is actually cooler because it's getting more fog. So you have to like kind of look at these nuances of the way the weather patterns work in that area. Laurent, I'm sorry, I cut you off earlier. Were you about to say something? Yes, we have to remember that Pinot Noir is a cold, and, and even Chardonnay is the same. It's, a, you know, we plant it in Napa or whatever, but at the end of the day, Pinot Noir is a cold climate grape. It needs cold nights. It needs hot days, warm days, not hot days to develop its complexity. And that's why... Oregon's makes amazing Pinot Noir. Germany has amazing Pinot Noir. Uh, Mornington Peninsula in the south of Australia as well, because it's a cooler climate, it's foggy. It, Pinot Noir is a very feminine, sensitive grapes. It, has, it, it likes diversity between nights and days, you know. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, because we, we have tasted a lot of these, you know, a lot of the Burgundian wines that have been showing higher levels of alcohol. And it's just, I wonder if there's, um, it's interesting to hear how you guys are trying to mitigate that, right? And moving forward. Well, um, you know, the one thing that I think is really important is that Laurent mentioned is your crop, how much fruit you're ripening can help moderate your weather. So for, you know, historically, and I think Robert Parker was probably the worst at always saying, Yes, they, got, they got two tons of the acre and that's perfect. You know, and it's like, if we get two tons of the acre in our warmer spots, we'll be picking in July because it's, it just ripens way too quickly. You know, and if you have three tons of the acre in our coolest spots, invariably there's going to be half the fruit is not going to be ripe. So there's you, again, you have to look at things, but crop load farming, you know, with leaf pulling, but also, I mean, they can't do this in Burgundy, but we don't irrigate anything until later in the season when we know that, okay, it's going to be 110 for a week. Like we don't want raisins. So we give it water beforehand. So there's things you can do, but yeah, I mean, crop load, all those things make a big difference. And these are all short-term fixes, frankly, if, if things don't change, obviously there's bigger issues than wine quality, but, um, it is something obviously we think about all the time and it's true. I mean, I think of like, oh, Vancouver Island, you know, my friend is from Vancouver Island. Now they're making great still wines. They never could before. Um, that said, it also gets twice as much snow as it used to in the winter. So it's not really an easy answer to say, well, I want to escape to Uruguay where they're, you know, <laughs> everything feels good and safe. Right. Guys, just a friendly reminder, I want to, I do want to make sure everyone knows that you have the opportunity for any Q&A if you want to pop any questions up or ask these guys anything <laughs> at all, wine related or not. 
I uh, just want to make sure you guys have the uh, the floor for uh, some Q&A here. Um, and one more thing, I, I don't want to disparage the Wine Advocate too much because I think that magazine is maybe better than it's ever been with their new writers. Mm -hmm. uh, William Kelly, who reviews Burgundy, is I think the best thing that's happened to that magazine in a long time. And his palate is, you know, I don't agree with everything, but most of it, I'm like, yeah, man, I love those wines. And I can't believe they got that score in Robert Parker. Um, and same is true with Venice with Neil Martin. I think he does, they have a very similar take, um, but William Kelly and the woman who now reviews Sonoma County, who gave our like 12% alcohol wine, you know, a high score, make my life better. <laughs> like, I mean, Robert Parker, I've met him. He's a nice enough guy, but I'm glad he retired, you know. Yeah, that's again, that's so interesting, right? These guys are literally, literally swinging the pendulum of consumer taste and what people are looking for. And, and thanks for that. That's actually really helpful. I kind of want to, because I was going to ask you guys also, who, is, who are some of the people that you're following, who you think are actually some of the, you know, very respectable tastemakers right now? Or anybody on your radar, Laurent, that you like to kind of follow or whose word you're actually taking a little bit more seriously? Not really, um, because about the press, about the ratings, about, I mean, at the end of the day, you always see the same names and you always see the bigger names with mass produced wines, with larger productions, with investors, whoever behind, who can afford. For me, it's who can afford to get those calls. So no, I do not follow much press. I do read it because I'm in the industry and I have to, but I have never bought a bottle of wines for a score. I don't know, I'd say uh, John Gilman is another one that I like, um, you from the seller, but he needs an editor like, you know, it's hard to read 500 pages every on Chablis with <laughs> tons of editing problems. But to your point, Laurent, like, I think William Kelly, at some level, he has a, a narrow band for which to work with, but I've seen new producers, smaller producers, particularly from the southern parts of Burgundy, uh, the hot coats, you know, they're starting to pay attention to that, obviously. And, you know, there's people like David Skildenek who reviews Germany and Austria for Venice that I think is amazing. Um, and it's not always the same people. It's just... Wine Spectator and Robert Parker historically was always the same wines. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. it's frustrating. And, and it's, that's always the same wines. it's always the same names. And Decanter is the worst. Guys. Decanter is like Negociant Burgundy. You're like, how many times are you going to review Latour or, you know, uh, or, uh, <laughs> uh, you name it. But no, sorry. The point yeah. is, is I think with more and more voices, you're sort of pushed as a writer to you have to go explore other producers. Otherwise, what's the point of buying up a subscription, you know? No, no, and the old philosophy and the old idea is, is to support farmers, to support people that don't even have enough, they don't want to spend the money to send a six pack to uh, one advocate in New York, you know? I even have lots of people, you know, you know that we work with then refuse to send samples to schools because they did in the past and they realized that it's not fair enough or they just decided then they can live with. And speaking of René Leclerc, the Bourgogne Pinot Noir that we are talking today, I'm not going to remember the year, but I think it was around 2005 and Robert Parker uh, set up an appointment and went to the winery that was the dad, René Leclerc, not Francois. And René Leclerc forgot about it and uh, he was not there. So Mr. Robert Parker, a week later, decided to walk in without being announced. And René Leclerc happened to be there and they started to taste the wines. And there is absolutely no new oak in the cellar at René Leclerc. And that's been like that for years. Absolutely no oak influence on the wines. And Mr. Parker started telling René Leclerc that uh, he should... Uh, invest in new barrels and put more <laughs> in the wines. And the uh, guy got kicked out of the winery. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, Laurent, uh, when, I was, when I was in Oregon, Francois was an intern 
uh, 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 Willa Kinsey, maybe. Very long hair and bell bottoms. He was with Catherine. Well. Is it Catherine? Is I don't know. His girl. No, uh, archery summit. Yeah, yeah, archery summit. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was. Uh, he stood out in Oregon. Francois <laughs> my buddy, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Small world, huh? So you remembered him as, as an intern in Oregon. Well, he was he was friends with Josh Burks from Josh went to school in Bone and his wife is from Bone. And so, you know, they, they ended up hanging out with a lot of the French interns when people would come over. So um, Francois was one of them. And, you know, because of Willa Kenzie and uh, Laurent Montelieu, you know, they they brought over a lot of French people that were just finishing their school and doing externships. Like an internship. Yes, exactly. Yeah. God, I would, I, I love that. I would love to, I need to go work as like a psalm in Burgundy or something. We, I love that how deeply ingrained that is in, in, in the culture of winemaking, like all these traveling winemakers, they go just go places to get exposure and new ideas from people. I'm like, I need to do that. I 100% want to do that. Hey, so I know we're, you know, we kind of shoot for about an hour here, but one thing I definitely wanted to touch on, um, Laurent, because this is, this is so your world and it's been so a brutal year in so many ways for this industry. But if you, I would really appreciate it if you could give us a little bit, I, I, if you could paint a picture of the reality of how the tariffs have affected you, how they are affecting us as consumers what that actually means. I know there's a couple of things on deck right now as far as there's going to be more modifications to the tariffs that are hitting French wines. I know it's been brutal for you. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for us as consumers of French wine here in the near future? Well, if you think COVID-19 has affected you or affected us all, it is absolutely nothing compared to the tariffs. The tariff are 25 percent. So last year, we were paying 25 percent on wines that were below 14 percent alcohol and non-sparkling. On December 30th or 31st, they announced that they were going to charge 25 percent on every single French French wines except champagne. So COVID is almost nothing compared to that tariff bill. It's all our profit goes there. It's, it's where all our money goes last year and it's looked like the same this year. Uh, of course, 2019 wasn't so uh, freezing winter in most of Loire, Burgundy, Champagne area. So now that we're starting to order, order the 2019 vintage, the price are going up about 10% because the vineyards frost about 30%. And then we are paying 25% tariff on top of that. For example, I'm sure there is many of you on this goal than used to enjoy a delicious glass of Sancerre for $16, $18 by the glass. Well, that Sancerre with the Prost, with the, 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 the Rez, with the tariff should be $22 right now. Can we, as importer, really transferring those 25 persons directly to you, the restaurant, directly to you, the consumer? No, nobody is going to accept, except our industry, except us. So we have to find a way of negotiating certain prices, certain payment method with the wineries. We have to swallow half of the tariff, and we have to pass on about 10% tariff to our sommeliers, to our retailers, to the consumer at the end of the day. Um, those tariffs started with a war between Airbus and between Airbus and Boeing. Nothing that you and I have to see with, and we don't understand why we have to pay for those. But this is our reality now. And 
they were put in place last year. Uh, they were extended on December 31st, as I said. Now we have a new administration, but we have received several emails and several articles were written uh, saying that those tariffs are in place until August minimum. Mm. Yes, it's a new administration. I do believe it is positive. Yes, the French government, the European community has opened the door to negotiate and remove those tariffs as a result. But the export of French wines to the United States has dropped about 33% in 2020. Yes, there is some COVID responsibility, but it's mostly for the tariff. Because at the end of the day, people still love, order, and drink French wines. 33% drop, that's insane. That's crazy. Yes. yes. Oh my God. It's a lot. We're talking millions of bottles. So where are they going? They're going at discounting price in chain stores of France because the, the restaurant industry is completely closed in France as well. They've been closed nine months overall altogether. I think they were able to reopen at two, three months in summer. So those wines are discounted. We do have a couple of producers and file for bankruptcy and, and more than we don't know because most of their business was with exports. And uh, Asia, Asia, believe it or not, has been doing pretty well. Yeah, that's what I've heard. I think Asia's picking up a lot of the, the demand, Asia right? uh, is a big, big, big uh, wine consumer, a bigger player in the market. And, uh, and uh, yeah, that's also why, unfortunately, the price is still going up, even before tariff, because there is demand for French wines, and especially Burgundy. We will never... Burgundy is a, is a gifted place in the world uh, for the terroir, for the monks, for the people that um, pass on the traditions from generation to generations, and uh, the price is only going to go up. <clears throat> it is our reality. <laughs> yeah, that's a, it. Helps me so much. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. I mean, that's in, that's going to open the door to domestic consumption, probably, right? Some, well, it's no. I think people in the U.S., you know, if you can afford Burgundy, you're going to keep drinking it. I mean, you can afford Burgundy because there's great producers at twenty-five dollars. But if you're really a collector or someone who seeks out the highest quality wines, they're they're relatively expensive. Um, we see it at, internationally, primarily in like Scandinavia. Just our wines are booming because historically, the red wine that they wanted there, it's kind of strange, but was Amarone. Um, and then very soon after that, they, they were into Burgundy and obviously German Riesling. Um, and so, you know, a $50 or $40 Bourgogne Rouge is sort of higher end from California or Oregon, where as long as you have sort of one foot in the classic style, you know, you're not just this bombastic, ripe, oaky Pinot Noir or Syrah or Chardonnay. So like, as of now, Scandinavia takes about 20% of our production. Oh, wow. And that's doubled in the last two years um, as Burgundy pricing has continued to, you know, on the high end, especially has, has gone up. It's really unrealistic for a restaurant to buy the, the full case anymore of whoever, you know. <clears throat> I mean, the one that I, I, I was told about was Delarlo, Romy Saint Vivant, they could get, you know, as much as they wanted but they only bought six bottles instead of six cases. You know, it's hard to sell a $500 bottle of wine on a restaurant um, when you can sell a $100 bottle. And I think that's, that's something that we've experienced as international sales have gone up for us dramatically in the last few years. Um, and COVID for us, what we see is more direct sales. The restaurants obviously aren't open um, for the most part. But even here, you know, the COVID, it's not the same as the, the tariffs, but COVID has forced many, many wineries to sell at chain stores um, throughout the country. Um, it's just the reality of, of having to have cash flow. 
you know, this, our whole industry is about cash flow. Like we buy a million dollars in grapes or farming. We need to have a wine, you know, we need to sell wine in August, September, October, December to pay for all of that. And then, you know, when we start bottling in the winter, we have all of the expenses of bottling. We needed to sell wine, which we started today. We're starting to sell wine for the next vintage today. And <clears throat> ultimately, um, I, I think the tariff is terrible for our wine community in, in the US. Um, Overall, for everyone. Yeah, and I, I think that ultimately you're gonna see a lot of, well, the bankruptcy is the first time I've heard someone say that, but I think it's going to be dramatic for small producers who, who don't own their own land and haven't had it for generations and have a lot of expense built into their business uh, in France and Spain and Italy. <laughs> <laughs> One subject, and we didn't break in with Anthony, and I'm curious, is uh, how about the fires last year? Uh, they were terrible. We we refused. Well, where I am now, they the fire was about a quarter mile from our facility. Um, we don't buy any grapes from this area, but the Sonoma Coast was impacted. Um, the closer you were to the Russian River, the worse it was. Yeah. That's, the the fire was just north of the Russian River. Um, we refused a lot of grapes. <clears throat> we took a risk on some, and they're smoke tainted. Um, uh, you know, for us, it's it's sort of in the future what the impact is because it's there's less wine to sell going forward, and we're we're Absolutely. still selling older vintages. But the growers we're already seeing properties for sale, and and owners who are trying to lease their properties so that they're not invested in the cost of farming anymore and trying to sell fruit um, when the fruits all refuse. You know, two weeks before harvest, oh. or having like now I'm. <clears throat> searching out crop insurance for the 30 acres that we lease in case we have to not pick next year uh, for fires. And the, you know, the price tripled since last year. So- It is definitely a dry winter. It's a dry winter, which may not be a problem because it actually decreases the fuel for next year. And there's a lot of areas that have burned already. So they're not as prone to igniting um, I mean, honestly, like we had a once a decade lightning storm. The last time it happened was 2008. 2008 Anderson Valley, all the wines were ruined. Um, but we are going to continue to have other types of wildfires. And it's, you know, I you have to work around it in some way or just not make wine. Exactly. Um, you know, and it, it was, the... it's weird, though. I mean, you know, at one point, two days in a row, it was dark all day and you're wearing a mask for covid and you know you're you're not allowed inside to congregate you can go inside to work on your wines but you can't congregate inside so you're outside sitting under a plastic tent and there's you know raining ash on you so it's a it's a you can it was stressful i mean we ended up enjoying ourselves somewhat because there was so little fruit that we had free time so we ended up drink. We were right. Our other facility is, I don't know, five minute walk from Bottle Barn, which is ten thousand square feet of wine, and they have everything from DRC down to you know two dollar California wine. <laughs> so we would go over there every day at like noon because we were done and buy a bunch of wine and sit in the smoke and drink wine. <laughs> because what are you gonna do? It's like if you're not laughing, you're gonna be like crying, really. I mean, that's the way that the, the year went. And Napa was even worse. They just didn't pick, I think, 85% of their fruit just is still on the vine. Um, yes, I drove by uh, in November, I think it was, and a lot of fruits were on the grapes. And, uh, and then you see a report, and the price of the Napa cap, tons of grapes is down like 45%. And... Uh, no, no, no. It's it's uh yeah. We have it was the first that. time I was ever at, I was offered what historically was thirty thousand dollar a ton Napa cab for like eight thousand a ton, and I was like, why? Why? Like, no, no, no. But you know, it's tempting because it's uh, I'm not allowed tech legally. I'm not allowed to say who it is, but it's like this famous vineyard, and you're like, well, why is it available to me? Like nobody knows who I am in Napa, you know. So. 
is the smoke team, if people are still going to make, so say somebody does purchase that, right? Who just wants to take the risk is, is smoke taint. Have you had this experience before? Is it, is it noticeably apparent in the wine? Oh yeah. I mean, it's going to stand out pretty hardcore. Yeah. I mean, it, depending on the level, I mean, there's, no. there's, there's the guayacals, which are the free, the volatile ones that you smell right away. Um, are present in wine at small levels and in barrels. You know, we tested full lots of wine and then we tested the new barrels and the new barrels one point higher consistently from the glycols in the barrel. But it doesn't taste like a barrel. It tastes like, it just tastes off-putting if it's bad enough. Right. Um, there's filters, there's new, new filters that people will use, uh, primarily people buying bulk. You know, the bulk market is selling a lot of smoky wines. Um, and ultimately, we didn't have any issues, anything significant with what we kept. We just didn't buy a lot of fruit. That's what it came down to. Um, so again, I think the growers are the ones that have faced the worst consequences of the fire. And then there's people who, I know a guy who was hired at Burgess Winery, which was purchased by Heinz mm -hmm. to start their new wine program. And he was going to move his small winery to that facility when he started the job. And obviously that burned out before they were even able to pick. Mm. So there's all these, you know, peripheral things aside from just wine quality that are affecting people's lives here. But, you know, that said, it's, it seems like a year ago at this point with everything that's gone on since then. So don't worry, don't worry, Rafael, you says rep. In a couple of years, I'm gonna bring you uh, a <laughs> Napa Cab, and they're gonna tell you it's oh volcano you, soil. You you literally beat me to it. I'm like I'm digging into this question. I'm like, how do I? It's for the know, people what who like uh, what regions are safe. What, which producers are safe to to even consider buying 2020 Napa Cab? You know, you just need your Lafroig consumers. <laughs> and you can smell, you smell it to them, right? Oh no, it's scary. Well, the, what I was getting at though is that they have a new filtration system that for bigger wines actually is effective, but for elegant wines, it, it takes all the character out of the wine simultaneously. No, nah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, That's so it, good vintage, man. yeah, it's uh, what honestly the joke around the winery was that your barrels were going to be racked to tank zero, meaning down the drain. Oh so God. we were dumping, you know, we've already dumped 12 barrels. Uh, back in December. Oh. The stuff we sort of rolled the dice on and the grower didn't charge us for it. And you know. Mm. And then you dump this 60 gallons of beautiful wine and you and it smells not like smoke anymore. It smells like beautiful wine. And you think, Jesus Christ, I just totally messed up. And then you taste the barrel and you're like, no, it's terrible. Like so. and the smoke is probably in the barrel too. You probably yeah, the barrels, the barrels consistently on testing have one part per billion higher, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's very dramatic difference. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So even, you know, brand new barrels have glycols, but there's other stuff. The main problem is these other chemicals that are bound and they don't become free until after nine months. So like you wait nine months and then they, they become less bound and you can filter more effectively through making bigger wines. But if you bottle like a rosé, say your Pinot Vineyard had really high smoke and you decide, well, we'll just make rosé. You put it in the bottle in March, and by summer it smells like an ashtray because all of the bound stuff comes out. And it's there's going to be a lot of rosé on your tasting table this year, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> oh my God. All right, guys. Hey, um, yeah. If you guys have any other questions, you know, feel free to um, to reach out to either one of these guys, or you can. Um, what she's saying to save it for fun to try in the future with friends. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I, I actually have two two magnums of the two lots we've dumped. I, I I put them in magnums and corked them, and they're sitting in my my garage um, to try after nine months, just to see how bad it gets when it's trapped and all of the volatility is trapped inside the bottle versus able to kind of blow off a little bit from the barrel. Yeah, I mean. It's going to be super interesting to see. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. It's going to be so terrible because <laughs> it tastes like smoked salmon or, you know, it's just a really. <laughs> oh I was going to say, yeah, exactly. <laughs>
use it to marinate some meat. Yeah. After the first taste, for sure, I'm sure it'll be bad. You guys, I, I can't thank you for your time. I could, I could really, I have so many questions. I could just chat with you guys for hours here. Maybe we can do it again sometime. Um, really, really appreciate your time. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, everybody who's been on the call, Jeff, Jameson, Isabel, everybody else, Kristen, I know Melissa took off, Nicole, Paul and Vicky, Scott, Michael, thank you guys so much for hopping on. Um, really appreciate you taking the time. Like I said, I have this recorded, so I will follow up with an email wine club email if you guys um for a little link if you wanted to revisit any of this and um again thank you guys you know best of luck laurent good luck out there we're going to continue to support you know hopefully power through this really appreciate everything you're doing for us anthony same same to you thank you for thank taking you. the time to to, to showcase the wines